Is or is? It is. Okay. And uh, guys, thank you for your work back there in the booth. Uh, don't let me blast anybody out, please. Thank you. Wow, this has been a great worship service. I mean, to have the special music, that was one I never heard that song before. Thank you very much. And the baby dedication, there's nothing more important. There's nothing more important in my way of thinking. I mean, baby dedication and baptisms are right there together. And that's people, young or old, falling into the hands of Jesus. Uh, there's nothing better than that. Hey, before I open the Bible to preach, uh, I'm not going to be done at 12. But if the food's ready and you guys want to go, just go ahead. <laughs> and I'll just go ahead and finish. <laughs> there would be no offense at all. Uh, because I want to say a couple things before I get to the sermon. <clears throat> Number one, did anybody watch general conference things, live streaming? Did you get to hear reports? If you haven't watched it, you go, go to the general conference website, and I know it'll direct you to the mission reports, the division reports. It was unbelievable. I mean, it just take your breath away. They, we've had this the last couple of years. We've had the largest, I think, in fact, I think it was this last year. We've had the largest single baptisms in the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, 124,000 people in, in one baptism. In one baptism. John, you couldn't believe that they took, I don't know, probably drone stuff, but pictures, and just up and down beaches were just full everywhere i never have seen anything like it if you could go and watch these reports it's just going to thrill your soul so i'm just going to tell you one short story but go watch the whole thing in africa there's been an unreached tribe that's been very difficult and if i'm remembering right it's the maasai and they keep cattle. That is their occupation, herds of cattle. It's been virtually unreachable. But there's a man there who heard about tithing. And he decided that he would do that. And you know, for us, if we have $10, what's tithe? Yeah, it'd be a dollar, right? Well, if you have 10 cows, what would be tithe? Well, he had, uh, I believe, it was several hundred cows. So he was fairly wealthy in their eyes. And he counted out all his cattle and gave that to the Seventh-day Adventist church. His family turned against him. The tribe turned against him, saying, you've lost your mind. You can't succeed by giving cows away. You can't do that. Of course, he's studying, and in the course, he becomes a Seventh-day Adventist and, you know, has returned this tithe. Everybody's <laughs> against him. But birthing time came, and every one of his cows that gave birth gave birth to twins. Wow. And for a cow to give birth to twins, that's rare anyway. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't happen regularly. But all of his did, and his goats and sheep did the same thing. Well, now all the villagers come to him, and they have pictures of it. They're surrounding him. And are asking what took place. How is this happening? And he says, it's the God in heaven. God in heaven did it. The whole village started tithing. <laughs> Same thing with their cows. 
So there's a man there that says he's the wealthiest guy, says that what he's going to do is he's going to build a little pond, a lake. And then he'll charge the herders to come and water, and that'd be another source of income to him. Well, our Seventh-day Adventist brother said, well, I'm going to build a bigger lake, and people can come for free and water their cattle there. And he hired a Bible worker that when they're watering the cattle, the Bible worker just stands out there all day long preaching. <laughs> There's a church. People are giving their hearts to Jesus Christ. Man, isn't that a great story? Go watch these things. It's just full of these stories. It, it, my heart just thrilled. And uh, you say, but what about the business sessions? Uh, you know, lots of discussion, but the stories are just wonderful. Get to the stories. It's just powerful. You'll be so happy. You'll say, man, Jesus is coming for all this to be happening. And then that one snapshot of 124,000 people. Okay, locally, I just heard the report at the academy. Please remember the academy in your offerings. Student assistance is what is needed. And you can go online and give, or you can send it right to them. I just heard the report that they've taken rooms in the girls' dorm fixing them up that they haven't been able to use or use for a guest room, turning them into student rooms. They've taken the guest rooms in the boys' dorm and turned those into student rooms. We have 171 Amen. students Amen. registered now that want to come, and we still have a waiting list of kids wanting to come. It's so important, guys. It's changing these young people's lives. We need an academy more than we've ever needed it before. Remember that in your tithes and offerings. Send something to help some of these kids go to school. That's good stuff, isn't it? Um, I want you to take your Bible and turn to Luke. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And I'm going to read verse 8. But it's based on uh, the woman who was in trouble being taken advantage of. And she kept going to the judge over and over and over again. Until he gave in. At first, you know, he says, I can't do anything for you. I can't do anything for you. Finally, he says, man, this woman isn't going to go away. She's so persistent that uh, he, he heard her case and ruled in her favor. But it ends this way with an interesting question. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless... When the Son of Man comes, what's the question? That's a big question, I think. See, I think that we think, well, we're all sitting here. There's about 70, 75 of us sitting here. And I would guess that probably most of us are thinking, will he find faith on the earth? I mean, we're here, right? Right? But Jesus asked the question, When I come, will I find faith? How bad do you think it's going to get to have to ask a question like that? And I would suggest that when I read that question, it causes me to want to re-examine my heart 
that when Jesus comes, will he find faith in me? Does that make sense to you? Well, there's two stories that I'm going to tell. Uh, I, you know, when I preach, I preach in stories. Because mostly, that's what the Bible is written in, is written in stories. And when we go to these stories, I want you to know, I believe these stories really happened. I believe they happened the way it says they happened. That those people actually existed. And that goes for the Old Testament and the New Testament. So when I read the stories, then the questions that come to my mind, if I was standing there in that story, where would I be? Would I be a disciple, a scoffer, a doubter? I mean, that, the stories are full of people. Where would I be? Second question. Why did God put these stories here? What would be the purpose of the two stories we're about to look at? I asked that question. So the two stories are both going to be found in Matthew. First one's Matthew chapter 8. And what we're responding to is Jesus saying, when the Son of Man returns, what? Will I find faith on the earth? So I want us to talk about faith for a little bit and what that actually is and what it actually means. This story is one of my favorite stories. It's going to start in verse 5. So Jesus, now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, Capernaum a centurion came to him pleading with him. Now, the moment I see centurion, I can know some things about this person. So the moment I see centurion, tell me some of the things I can know about this person. He's a soldier. He's a Roman soldier. He has an authority. What else can I know? Man, we authority because centurion denotes what? at least a hundred men at his command. So, okay, I got a Roman soldier, a man of authority with at least a hundred soldiers. What else can I know? Huh? He's the Jewish people that's below him. Yeah. And he's in a land where the people don't like him. Okay. So I can know... He's hated. He's hated. Yeah. Right? right? I can know he's hated. He's the invading army. Yeah. He's the guy who would say, hey, carry this pack for a mile. Right? right? And of course, the Bible tells you how to respond to that, <laughs> which wasn't pleasant. But uh, So I know he's hated. More than hated, Jesus had at least two disciples who had knives that would kill him if they caught him alone. Because they were zealots. And that's what zealots did. Hung around at night. If a Roman soldier went by by himself, they killed him. You say, well, how do you know they had knives? Because even at the last meal before the crucifixion, Jesus out in the garden says, does anybody have any swords? And two of them came out. <laughs> Jesus said, that's enough. It'll do <laughs> for what's about to take place. He's hated. How hated? They didn't believe the people around that he could be saved. They didn't believe he could be saved. So when this Roman centurion walks up to Jesus, there's an expectation in that crowd 
of what they believe Jesus is going to do. What is the expectation? They believe that. They believe Jesus isn't going to get close to this guy. They believe Jesus isn't going to talk to this man. And you say, well, how do you know that? How did they recognize who the Messiah would be? Number one teaching among the Jews, if you were going to recognize the Messiah, how would you know him? He's going to throw the Romans out. He's going to take the throne. And the Jewish nation is going to rule the world. That was embedded in their beliefs. That is the very way that they said we will recognize the Messiah. And they believe Jesus is the Messiah. So what do they think he's going to do? Fulfill their vision of the Messiah. You know, I want to give a caution here. As much as all of us may think we know about the Bible, don't put Jesus in a box. God is God. And we're created. And God will do what God does. And sometimes that's not going to meet our expectations. Sometimes that's going to leave us saying, wait a minute. Let God be God. Let Him reign. Because you may have a wrong expectation. Things may not happen just the way you think they're going to happen. Well, the guy comes up, says to Jesus, uh, he needs help. And this is quick, isn't it? Jesus enters Capernaum. A centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Uh, they were fairly disappointed because that's a blow at their view of who the Messiah is. And I want to tell you that doesn't get better as Jesus lives. Ultimately, all who said to Jesus, you will be king, all turned against him or ran away. Christ died alone. I'll come. Now what's interesting to me is, how does the centurion feel about himself? So he thinks about himself exactly what they think about him. Right? Hey, I'll come and heal your servant. Don't come. I am not worthy. I'm not worthy for you to even come to my house. But here's what I know. Just speak the word. Because I know you're a man of authority. And I'm a man of authority. And I say, go, and they go, and come, and they come. All you need to do, Jesus, is just speak the word. That's enough for me. How does Jesus sum up that faith? Jesus says, this man. Now, Jesus doesn't say these words, but it is this man whom we all despise, who we hate, who we don't even think can go to heaven, is manifesting the greatest faith I have ever seen. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is the greatest faith 
I've ever seen. Uh, I'll come back, but second story. Luke chapter 15. Not Luke, I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 15. And we're going to start at verse 21. It says, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Now let's, what can I know there? The moment I see woman of Canaan, what can I know? She's a heathen. She's a Gentile. What can I know? More. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm, what more can I know? Uh, yeah. Number one, she shouldn't have been alive. Right? Because if you go back to the Old Testament, how did Israel fail? All the Canaanites are supposed to be gone. But they didn't. They intermarried, intermingled, so now a Canaanite woman comes. Let me tell you how low she is. She is not human. They don't view her as human. They view her as nobody. In fact, I read one of the laws in keeping the Sabbath. And this wasn't even a Canaanite woman. It was just a woman. If you were on your way to the synagogue, and it was Sabbath, and a woman had fallen into the river yelling for help, go to the synagogue, keep the Sabbath. Come back after Sabbath. If she's still there, get her out. This woman is less than that. I think, what, why, why do I dwell on these things? Because to tell you, the moment I walk out of that, it should not be in here. Right? In here, it should be brothers and sisters. And guys, if anybody in here is in a fight with each other, and you can say, well, Dean, nobody is. Well, for one thing, I don't believe that. Because there's 75 of us here. And you get 75 people together. Amazing things happen. But if there is, make peace. And do it quickly. Husbands and wives, make peace in your homes. Invite the Lord Jesus Christ to come in. He is soon to return. And the Bible says, as much as possible that lieth in us, we should be at peace. It's time to be at peace. When I come in here, this should be the closest family to me on planet Earth. Now, when I go out those doors, I'm going to face these attitudes right here that we're reading about. Man, I can't believe it. People hate each other. And we're seeing this whole world filled with violence because of the hatred. I mean, I don't know. You watch the news. I watch the news. Somebody explain to me why Russia invades the Ukraine. Man, they were one nation for a long time. What triggers that? I mean, within months, we've got thousands of people dead. The city's destroyed. You see pictures of your own brothers and sisters in basements having church. How does that even happen? People hate each other. People don't like each other. This woman understands that. 
It's interesting, isn't it? Do you think she knows these people hate her? So there's these 12 guys in Jesus who would not even Poseidon. They would walk around that region before they'd go through it. So they're shocked that Jesus says, let's go, we're going to go there. They're shocked that he would even do that. She knows that. Twelve men who hate her. Jesus, who says nothing. Would you even go? Would you even go up to them? Well, listen to what she says. Cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord. Son of David, my daughter is severely demon-possessed. The moment she says, Jesus Lord, Son of David, what did she just say? Yeah, Son of David, that term applies solely to who? The Messiah. So this woman is saying, you are the Messiah. Have mercy on me. What's Jesus do? Now, I'm, I'm trying to demonstrate. When you do something, see, these stories kind of work against us. You know why? Because we know them. And we want to skip to the end. But don't skip to the end. Because what unfolds is important. So this woman says, is crying out after them. So what picture does that put in your mind? Crying out after them. They're moving. And she's back there somewhere crying, Jesus, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. What's Jesus keep doing? He keeps moving. He doesn't say a word which is exactly what the disciples thought he ought to do. Are there people in this community that are back there somewhere and the most they deserve is silence? Well, think of yourself. You're back there. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. He doesn't turn around. He doesn't look. He just keeps walking. What would you do? I would say, based on what I see take place, most of us would just go away offended. Because he didn't answer the way we thought he should answer. And we get offended. And you say, how do you know that? Because I'm telling you, we get so offended. You come in the door, somebody doesn't see your hand. They don't say hello to you. You come in and sit down, go home, don't come back. Why? Well, oh, it's unfriendly. Nobody said hello to me. I'm telling you, in the years of ministry, John, you know this is true. And elders, if you're doing visiting, you know it's true. Man, how many excuses do you get of why people don't come to church? It's everything you can think of. But I want to tell you something. Those excuses all work with us. It was raining. But not in church it wasn't raining. I mean, the roof wasn't leaking or anything. Uh, well, I slept in well i you know this that i'm i'm telling it's too cold snow on the ground that quarter inch really is dangerous i i'm telling you guys all those excuses work with us but just understand every excuse you come up with Someday you're going to look into the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ and He's going to show you His hands. See how those excuses go there. The man who died on the cross for you, raining, doesn't work. 
What's she do? She yells louder. In fact, she yells so loud that what do the disciples do? They say, see, they're not even going to get this. Why wouldn't they just turn around and say, get out of here? No, they tell Jesus, you tell her we're not talking to her. I mean, you talk to the Roman soldier. Well, talk to her. We're not going to talk to her. Tell her to go away. What does she do? She cries after us. She's troubling us. So Jesus does answer her. What's the answer? I wasn't sent here to help you. I wasn't sent here to help you. I was sent here to help the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You're a king which agrees with their theology. Which says, oh, finally, Jesus is on the straight and narrow. Not worthy of salvation. What does she do? Look right at the scripture. What does she do? Verse 25. She came, knelt down, and worshiped him. Would you? I'm not sent here to help you. And she falls down and worships him. And no other hope. Help me. Lord, help me. And this doesn't get any better. So Jesus said, it's not good to take the food off the table of the children and give it to little dogs. Now, come on. What would you do? I'm, I mean, I probably wouldn't have done anything because I wouldn't have even been there. Because I'd already been offended that he didn't talk to me. <laughs> but it's, if you are there, he's just called you a dog, which is exactly what society, including those 12, said she's not human. And it seems like Jesus is agreeing with that. How does she answer? She says, that's true. I agree with you. But even a little dog will get a crumb that falls off the table. Even a little dog will get a crumb that falls off the table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, Great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. That very hour her daughter was healed. Two stories on faith. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Two examples of faith. One's the greatest faith I've ever seen. Woman, great is your faith. And I've pondered that. What was the greatest faith all about? Do you know if that centurion was alive today, do you know what we would call him? A creationist. That guy would believe the heavens were created by the glory of God for he, for he what? He spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. He believed that this man, this Messiah, in front of him wasn't just a man of authority. He's the creator of the universe. 
And Jesus called that the greatest faith I've ever seen. Are you a creationist? Now, of course, everybody's going to say yes, because we think, yeah, there's evolution over there. And certainly we don't believe in evolution. But you have the flat tire. And the words out of your mouth are, your creator God. Right? Do you know how I know whether we're creationists or not? If we approach Jesus as the creator. And I'm telling you that murmuring and complaining says we're not creationists. We act as if we're orphans. We act as if things are happening on this earth that Jesus has no knowledge of. That Jesus doesn't even know. And our prayers are more like the prayers of Baal. Where are you, O Baal? Why don't you hear us, O Baal? Why don't... We do not serve a distant God. We serve an ever-present God who can speak and it is done, who commands and it stands fast. Stop murmuring and complaining. We have the Creator. Are you worried about your kids? Take them to the Creator. Because you can't do a thing for your kids. You can't do anything for your own heart. But Jesus can give you a new heart. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Then, Creator God, if I really believe Jesus is a Creator, my life should be a life of praise. Amen. Constant hope, even when I don't understand. Creator God. And by the way, if you're placing your children in schools where they're being taught daily evolution and no morals, because if you're an evolutionist, you have no morals. There's no basis for morals. Get your kids out of those schools. Get them out. You say, what are we going to do? Well, start a school right there. And you say... Yeah, but we can't. Why? Because we don't have any money. That's exactly what I'm talking about here. The cattle on a thousand hills are God's. If you have need in this community for witness and outreach, ask Him. Plead with Him persistently. That's what it means to worship the Creator. Okay, the woman. I'm almost done. The woman. Why was her faith great? <clears throat> well, here's what I believed. She believed he was the Messiah. And the moment she says, Son of David, she has a view of the Messiah. And here's what she knew. I don't understand anything that's happening here. <coughs> I don't understand it. Personally, when I first read this parable, I didn't understand it either. I thought, what in the world? It seems kind of mean, to tell you the truth. And I don't think Jesus is mean, so I just figured there's something I'm not understanding here. The whole thing was Jesus teaching the disciples something. Because he's treating her the way they would treat her. And she doesn't, she doesn't understand it, but she keeps persisting. Because she knows one truth above all truths, this man will not forsake me. This man won't turn away from me. When I need help... He's ultimately going to help me. I don't know why he's calling me a dog. I don't know why he's saying I can't be saved. I don't know any of that except I know he loves me 
and he isn't going to turn away from me. And Jesus says, you want to see great faith? There's great faith. We got a time of trouble that's breaking on this world, and it's going to include you. You're going to lose everything you got before you get out of this world. Will you say, I don't have a clue of what's happening here. I don't know why that judge rules against me. I don't know why I'm sitting here in jail. I don't know why my house, my job is gone. But this I know. He will never leave me or forsake me. He will be with me. And at some point, he's going to turn and say, be it done to your faith. Two great examples of faith. He's creator. And he loves you. I don't care how you're feeling right now. You may have been betrayed by people. You may have been betrayed by your own family. It doesn't matter. He loves you. And he will never leave you. And he will never forsake you. Amen. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Thank you for the message, Dean. Let's turn on our hymnals to number 109 and stand and sing our closing song, Marvelous Grace. Number 109, as stand as we sing.